All right, welcome everyone. So today we start a new section uh, in the kernel, the so-called kernel jungle, whose goal is basically to give you more examples of kernel functions, how to choose a kernel. The question here is that um, we will see, and, and you may have guessed that the choice of a kernel is a, is a crucial uh, factor in the performance of algorithms of kernel methods. But it remains a bit obscure, maybe, um, to know which kernel to use in which cases, and maybe how to design a specific kernel for a specific application. So what we're going to try to discuss in this, sec in this session and in the next ones is first to list you a bit a set of kernels that exist, and more importantly, try to share with you um, how to understand the, the impact they have on the method, in particular, how they can be used to put prior knowledge uh, in your problem. So today we're going to discuss specifically what are called green kernels. Um, it's a bit specific, but this will allow us to make links between the choice of the kernel function on the one hand and the design of a function space uh, for better understand the smoothness properties. And then we directly start with a simple example. Let's forget for a second about kernels and consider the following problem, uh, which is called spline regression. So in these examples, you have x, y points. You want to predict y from x, as you see on the picture. Um, and, and so your regression function that we learn here is the red line. And it's formalized, is defined as a function. I will skip the details of what is the function space, but just look at the objective function. So it's a function f that minimizes the mean squared error, so the sum of y i minus f of x i squared. This is uh, small if the red uh, the red curve fits well the points. Uh, but we want to regularize that. And a natural way to regularize, for example, would be to assume that f has, has two derivatives and to penalize the squared L2 norm of the second derivative of f. So why would you want to do that? This is an example where uh, this could be motivated by, for example, physical principles. If you see the, the red, um, you know, the red line as some kind of blade uh, whose energy, you know, you want it to be as smooth as possible and you, you would quantify the smoothness in terms of some torsion energy maybe. And, you know, based on some basic physical principles, uh, you could you could decide that the torsion energy is proportional to the integral of the second derivative of it, right? This is an example. Now, the question is, how does that relate to what we have seen so far, the kernel methods? What we're going to see now is that, in fact, this problem, so you see where the smoothness is defined based on some prior knowledge, is uh, a kernel regression problem. And the question is, what is the kernel corresponding to this problem? And this is what we will see now. OK, so let's, let's, let's continue a bit on this example and change it a bit to make it a bit simpler in these notes, uh, but be a bit more formal. So here, remember that our goal would be, <coughs> would be to study some function spaces where the norm is the L2 norm of the second derivative. Here we'll take the simpler case where we just focus on the first derivative just because it will make our computations a bit shorter and simpler. But as an exercise, you can treat exactly the, the example on, on the previous slide uh, with the same uh, approach. So here, let's start formally by defining what could be um, the space on which we work on. So here, we define a Hebert space, capital H, made of functions. So we just consider functions from the interval 0, 1 to R, 0, 1 being the, the range of the uh, we, we assume that the function is absolutely continuous. I'll say a word about that later. But suffice it to say that it's just to allow us to talk about the, the derivative of f as a L2 function. Right? And we assume that we consider functions which are, uh, which are such that f of 0 is equal to 0. And now on that set of function, we define a bracket, which is a bilinear form. This can be easily seen as the, the following equation f bracket g is defined as the integral between f prime of u and g prime of u du. 
So notice that this is well defined if we assume that f and g are in H, because then f prime and g prime are in L2. This is part of the definition of f of H. Okay, so why do we do that? Well, you see that if we if we were able to show, for example, that this space H is a Hilbert space, and this is what we'll do, then the norm in the Hilbert space of a function f would be the integral between 0 and 1 of f prime of u square, this is the square norm, which would be exactly the L2 norm square of f prime. So this looks a bit like the, the example on the previous slide, where we cared about the L2 norm of the second derivative. Here it's just the first derivative, right? Okay, so what can we say about that space? Well, here is the main theorem, which is, which may look a bit magical, but we'll try to explain why it's not so magical. The main theorem is that this space, you see that was defined just because we cared about the derivative of f uh, in the L2 space, uh, so in the Hilbert space of L2 functions. In fact, this space is an RKHS. And the corresponding kernel, so the reproducing kernel of that space, uh, is equal to the function k of xy equals mean of xy. So, you notice that the function mean of xy, we have seen it in some examples previously, we know that it is a positive definite function. But so far, we gave little insight of, you know, why it would be an interesting uh, function or not. Now, this theorem makes a link between the function k of xy equals mean of xy, and the RKHS it induces. I'll come back to the previous slide. And so another way to say is that this, the RKHS of the mean kernel is equal to that functional space, so the space of functions, which are absolutely continuous, which are equal to 0 and 0, and such that the inner product between two functions is the L2 inner product between their derivatives. OK, so you see that here it sounds a bit I said magical before, it's just that it's not very clear why the mean function would be related to the to that space. So before proving that, let's see what the consequences of this fact are. Well, one consequence is that now we have the equivalence between one RKHS norm and one particular norm, which is the L2 norm of F prime. And so this means that in particular, if you want to solve a problem like the one I mentioned before, the spline problem, which would be minimize so find a function that minimizes the sum of yi minus f of xi square, plus lambda times the integral of f prime of t squared dt. Then the second term is exactly the square norm of f in RKHS. So the same. So this equation can exactly be rewritten as some kernel rich regression problem. Okay. And so for example, if you have implemented the kernel rich regression problem, which you may have done using the equation we showed before, then you can just use it with the mean kernel, and this will solve the spline regression problem, which is written in that slide. Okay, so let's now try, you know, to prove the theorem, uh, because it's not obvious. And before that, let me just uh, say quickly uh, why we talk of absolutely continuous functions. So it's a bit technical. I will. You know, if you're not familiar with that, just take the time to read the slide and potentially check some textbook in mathematics. But basically, absolutely continuous for a function, um, here is the definition is on the slide, but is, is a notion which is a bit stronger than just continuous or even uniformly continuous. And the important fact here is that uh, a function is absolutely continuous if and only if it has derivatives almost everywhere the derivative is the big integral, and we can write the, the apparently simple formula that for any x, f of x is equal to f plus well, between a of x of f prime of t dt. Right, it's just so absolutely continuous just here to make sure we can write this, and so we, we correctly define the Hilbert space, the integral as a set. All right, so let's try to prove the theorem. Remember, the theorem said that the RKHS of the mean kernel is the space capital H that was defined a few slides before. So to prove the theorem, as usual, we need to, to prove three things. So the first is to show that the, the space capital H is indeed a Hilbert space of functions. 
And then to prove that it's the archaic chase, we need to prove the two properties of an, of an archaic chase once you have a Hilbert space, which are that first for the function of the x must be in the Hilbert space. Two, for any x and f, we need to have the reproducing property that says that f of x is equal to the inner product between f and kx. All right, so first, is capital H a Hilbert space of function? The answer is yes. How to prove that? Well, first we, sh we show that it's a pre-Hilbert space, meaning it's a vector space endowed with some inner product. So the fact that it's a vector space is trivial. Uh, you know, it's made of functions, and you can check that the sum of functions is in the space, etc. The fact that the bracket is bilinear is also uh, trivial. And the fact that the bracket is a non-negative bilinear form is obvious, because if you come back to the bracket, definition uh, is the inner product between f prime and g prime. So if you apply it to f bracket itself, it's a non-negative number. It's a squared L to norm of the derivative. Right, so now let's show, to, to prove that we have a Hilbert space, we need, in addition, to show that the bracket is equal to zero if and only if f is the zero function. To prove that, we first notice that because f is absolutely continuous in that space, we can write that for any x, f of x is equal to f of zero plus the integral between zero and x of f prime of u du. The fact that f of 0 is equal to 0 in the Hilbert space allows us to remove the first term and so simply to write f of x as the integral between 0 and x of f prime of u du. Now, the, the absolute norm of f of x can therefore be upper bound using cauchy schwarz inequality in the, uh, in, the, in the Hilbert space L2 of, of 0, 1 by just upper bounding the integral between 0 and x of f prime of u du by the product of the integral between 0 and 1 of the uh, indicator function between 0 and x, so the integral is rest square root of x, times the integral between 0 and 1 of f prime of u square uh, du, square root of that. This is just Cauchy-Schwarz. And, and, and then we recognize here the uh, f bracket itself. So finally, we can upper bound f of x in absolute value by square root of x times f bracket f square root. And so this implies that if f bracket f is equal to 0, then f of x is equal to 0 for any x. So f is the 0 function. So this allows to conclude that uh, the bracket is, in fact, an inner product because it's non-negative. Uh, it's equal to 0 if and only f is equal to 0. And therefore, that the space capital H is a pre Hilbert space, meaning a vector space endowed with an inner product. The only thing that remains to be shown is, is that uh, H is complete uh, to, to be able to say that it's a Hilbert space. So, to show that the space is complete, we typically take a Cauchy sequence of function in the space capital H, so Cauchy in the sense of the bracket that we defined. Now, from the definition of the bracket, we know that. Uh, you know, the norm of a function is the L2 norm of the derivative. So if fn is Cauchy in the bracket, it means that f prime n is a Cauchy sequence in L2 uh, of 0, 1. And because L2 itself is a Hilbert space, we know that any Cauchy sequence converges in L2 to a function g. So remember that this step, g, is not really a function. It's a element of L2, which is a class of equivalence of functions. Now, this is enough, because uh, first notice that, based on the inequality that we showed in the previous slide, where we can upper bound f of x by a constant times the, the, the norm of f in H, we know that if fn is a Cauchy sequence in, in capital H, then for any x, fn of x is also a Cauchy sequence in R. Okay. And because R is complete, we know that for any x, the, the sequence fn of x has a limit, a real number, that we can call f of x. And so this defines a function f of x as the pointwise limit of fn of x. And now, because we know that fn of x is equal to the integral between 0 and x of fn prime of u, we can take the limit of this thing. And because the limit of f 
between L2 is equal to G, you can take the limit under the integral to obtain that f of x is equal to the integral between 0 and x of the, of the function class G of u d. All right, so in particular, this shows that uh, f is absolutely continuous. Go back to the slide of absolute continuity to remind you that uh, absolutely continuous is equivalent uh, to the fact that there exists a function g such that the previous line holds. All right, so f is absolutely continuous, and in addition, f prime of u is equal to g, where g is a function uh, uh, in L2. All right, so we have a function f. Uh, we know that its derivative is defined almost everywhere. It is in L2. Uh, what else do we need to, to show? Well, uh, we, we can easily get that f of 0, uh, because that definition is equal to the limit of fn of 0, and for each n, fn is in capital H, implies that f of 0 is equal to 0. Right? And finally, uh, let's conclude by showing that f as a function is a limit uh, of the sequence fn in capital H. For that, we need to compute the limit of the distance between fn and f in the space capital H. But by definition, this uh, distance is equal to the L2 distance between f prime uh, and, 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 uh, and gn, which is equal to f prime n. Um, and therefore, uh, this goes to zero because we have convergence uh, of uh, of f prime to gn in L2. All right, so capital H is a Hilbert space. Now remember that to prove the, that it's in RKHS, we have two more things to prove, and the two more things are surprisingly easy. The first is that we need to show that for any x, kx, so the function that to any y associates k of xy is in capital H. So let's look at the function. We, you know, by definition, k of x, y is equal to mean of x, y. So if we fix x and we consider mean of x, y as a function of y, we obtain the function that, that is plotted here. And sorry, there is a, a small confusion that the s that you see so x is just linear up to x and constant and is continuous. So this is clearly a function that is in capital H. It's continuous, almost everywhere differentiable, is equal to 0 in 0. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, kx is in the space capital H. Finally, the last thing we have to prove is that for any function f in capital H and for any x, we, we should have the replacing property that f bracket kx should be equal to f of x. How do we get that? Well, we just compute it. We compute the inner product between f of kx. By definition, this is the integral between 0 and 1 of the derivative of x times the derivative of kx. But you know, using the picture in the previous slide, you see that the derivative of kx is equal to 1 between 0 and x, and to 0 between x and 1. So when you multiply it by f prime of u, you just obtain the integral between 0 and x of f prime of u du. And because f uh, is supposed to be absolutely uh, continuous, this is equal to f of x. Right, so finally, this shows all the properties and therefore that uh, the space capital H is the RKHS of the mean function. All right, so, you know, this simple example, I said, we could generalize it, for example, to the initial spline regression problem I mentioned, where instead of the L2 norm of f prime, we have the L2 norm of f second derivative. In fact, there is an even broader generalization, and I will just quickly mention uh, this, and this is what we call the green kernels. So the broader generalization is that many, um, many norms which are defined as L2 norms of derivatives of function are in fact uh, RKHS norms. And uh, more precisely, uh, if we if we consider, if suppose that as prior knowledge we want to define a norm as some L2 norm of some differentiable operator applied to F. So if you call D a differentiable operator, suppose that D could be 
the first derivative or the second derivative, or it could be a partial derivative if we have a, a function of multiple variables. Then we can consider the bracket df bracket dg in L2 and say, could that be a candidate in a product in our KHS? So we could define presumably a, a space capital H where this is an inner product. And so what we're going to show now uh, is that if this uh, definition is a define a function space capital H such that this get defines an inner product, then this capital H is an RKHS, right? So this is what we did before. We just took for D the first derivative, and we showed that this is an RKHS. And the question is, what 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 is the kernel associated to that RKHS? What is the reproducing kernel of this space? And the theorem here that we're going to prove is that uh, the the reproducing kernel, so like the mean function in the previous example. It is what's called a green function of the operator D star D, where D star D knows the adjoint of D in L2. Um, this is a bit technical, maybe, so I'm going to try to explain to you what is the green function, what is D star, and, and you will see that it's quite natural uh, to obtain this theorem. But the take home message here is that if you consider, uh, if you start from the norm defined as the L2 norm between derivatives, then there is a systematic way to recover the kernel, right? And so there is no magic here. In the previous example, I started for the norm and I told you, guess what? The mean function is the reproducing kernel. Then what we're going to discuss now is how you could find by yourself that the mean kernel is the correct function, right? And in fact, the mean kernel, using the words of this theorem, is nothing but the green function of the operator D or D, where D is the first derivative operator. All right, so to try to make the things a little bit more clear, uh, let me start by uh, explaining what we mean by green function. So green function is just a general concept uh, widely used to solve uh, partial differential uh, equations. Uh, suppose you want to solve an equation of the form F equals DG. Remember that D is a differentiable operator, um, then it's common to look for solutions, uh, so to look for G, which are convolutions of F with the kernel, so of the form G of X is equal to the integral of K of X, Y, F of Y, DY. Uh, and then the question is, what is K? Like, we want to find a function K such that this integral is the solution to the differential, uh, to the differential equation. So what, what the question, uh, what, what, what is the constraint on K in order to make sure that G is the solution of the equation F equal DG? You see that if you just plug, uh, replace G by this expression in the uh, differential equation, uh, what we need to have is that for any X, F of X should be equal to DG of X, and DG of X is if G can be written as the integral, would be the L2 in a product between D, K, X, and F, right? And so if there is a function k such that f of x is equal to the L2 in a product between dkx and f, we call k the green function of the operator d. So notice that this equation looks a bit like the reproducing priority of our KHS, where we had f of x is equal to the inner product between f and kx. But the main difference is that the inner product here is not in capital H, but it's in L2. And so when we are in L2, we talk of green function. All right, so now we're going to prove the theorem, you know, which uh, looked a bit complicated, but we just said that uh, the Hilbert space is in our KHS and the, and the kernel is a green function of this or D. So here we assume that capital H is a Hilbert space, right? So we assume that you have been careful enough uh, to design constraints on the functions in F so that you have a Hilbert space. And in our previous examples, for example, um, this is what we did when we enforced f to be absolutely continuous, to have f of 0 equal to 0, etc. Here we assume that this is already solved. What we're going to prove is that in this case, the Hilbert space is in our KHS. Right? So we assume that we have a Hilbert space, and we assume that the, the inner product in the Hilbert space is the L2 inner product 
uh, between DF and DG. Now the question is, is that an RKHS uh, for, for the kernel K? And so the kernel K, we assume, is the green function of the operator D star D. So the first question is, does Kx belong to capital H for any S? For that, we need to estimate uh, the you know bracket between Kx in itself and check that it's finite. So the kernel, be, so the the inner product between Kx in itself in in the space in the space would be uh, the L2 inner product between dKx and itself. Um, then we can move the D operator from the right to the left using the adjoint function, which says here we talk the adjoint of the L2. So this is equal to the L2 inner product between D star D, Kx, and Kx. And so by construction, because, because Kx is supposed to be the green function of D star D, this is equal to Kx of S, right? So this is where we use the green function property. And of course, this is finite if we, you know, if we assume that uh, the function, the green function is well defined. All right, so the second thing that we need to check is the replacing property in the space capital H. And so this is just obtained by rewriting f of x first using the green function property as the inner product in L2 between d star d, kx, and f. Then uh, moving d star from the left to the right because the adjoint of the adjoint is itself. So this is equal in L2 to the inner product between d, kx, and df. And finally, by definition, this is the inner product in capital H, kx between kx and f. Right, so this shows that uh, f of x is equal to f in our product kx in capital H, and therefore that capital H is indeed an RKHS with k as a producing kernel. So you see this is quite abstract and general, but again, the take home message is that if you start with some uh, differentiable operator d and you want to design a space of function where the norm is equal to the L2 norm of DF um, uh, using prior knowledge, then you can rewrite it often as an RKHS. And to find the kernel, you need to solve the problem of what is the green function of the operator D star D. Right, and so just to make this um, a little bit more clear, let's come back to our previous example and show how you could have found that the mean kernel is the kernel of the space we define. So in our previous example, we took the space x to be the int interval 0, 1, and the d operator to be just the derivative, meaning df of u was, by definition, equal to f prime of u d. So in order to find k such that f of x is equal to the inner product in L2, of d star d kx and f. And, and so this is just an equation to solve. Maybe it's sometimes it's hard to solve, but here we will see that it's not so complicated to solve. So to solve it, we notice that we can move as often the d star operator to the right of the bracket to obtain that we need to have f of x equals to the L2 inner product between d kx and df. And this using the fact that d operator is just taking the first derivative is equal to the integral between 0 and 1 of kx prime of u times f prime of u du. And now the question is, can you find k such that f of x is equal to the integral between 0 and 1 of k prime x of u, f prime of u du? Here, probably you recognize that it's possible if you just take for kx prime of u the function which is the um, 1 on 0x and 0 outside, because then you would recover the standard equation that f of x is equal to the integral between 0 and x of f prime of ud. So this gives you k prime x. Now, in order to get kx, you just need to integrate this. So, you know, this is very simple now because you have the derivative of kx. So to get kx itself, you take uh, the, the primitive of this equation, which is linear between 0 and x, and constant after x. Notice that this primitive is defined up to a constant, but because you want kx to be in capital H, you need to ensure that kx of u 
sorry, kx of zero is equal to zero, and therefore the constant to add is equal to zero. Right, so this gives you kx, and from kx you obtain k of x x prime as kx of x prime, which points down to the main function. Right, so this shows you how you can systematically start from the differentiable operator d, k as the grid function of the operator d star there. And so as an exercise, I would encourage you to consider the first problem uh, that motivated this section, the spline regression, where for d we take the second derivative and try to figure out by yourself uh, what are the constraints you need to put on the space of functions uh, to make sure that it's a Hilbert space, and second, how to find the replacing kernel uh, that defines that RKHS. Next time, we'll move on to a different category of kernels, which are called Mercer kernels. And enjoy the landscape.